So um, the exam, I think I already said this. Make sure you can see the whole screen here. Oh, back there. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, the exam. 45 multiple choice questions, five fill in the blanks with a word bank. And then there's like two bonus fill in the blanks using the same word, word bank. Uh, chapters one through three, the study guide is up. Um, all of the information is from my slides. There's some more applied questions, some more basic questions. So I might set up a scenario and ask you a question based on something from my slides. So it won't be direct, you know, rote memorization from the slides, the whole for every question. Um, I'm trying to think of any more hints. It's, I think one of the best ways to study is to quiz yourself. Um, and we're going to do an interactive quiz uh, in just a second. I'll post that link so you can go back to that quiz and look at the questions and study them and quiz yourself again on those. But these will give you a good idea of some of the, these are kind of some more basic questions that I'll ask just because the more involved questions are just a lot of, a lot more text and it's kind of tough to do <clears throat> in a short interactive quiz kind of setup. But these will give you a good idea and hopefully remind you of some of the different main topics that I'll be asking about in case you've forgotten about them. I will say um, this is so these chapters one through three, there's a lot of review stuff from general biology, hopefully, that sounds familiar. So stockpile as many points as you can. The material is going to get harder and a lot of it's going to be new unless you've had some kind of anatomy course before. So it gets, I would say, more difficult after this one. So stockpile as many points as you can for this exam. Don't start out in the hole. That's my my best suggestion. Any other questions about the setup of the exam or structure or what's on it? Okay. Let's do, um, so instead of Kahoot, I've used Kahoot in the past. I'm gonna use a different quiz engine or I've set up a quiz in a different quiz engine called Quizzes. Have you guys used this before? Okay, it's just a different free quiz engine. I use it now because I think it's easier to study. So you can see this is the first question. You can look at the question and not have the answer show up. And you can see the whole question and all of the answers, which I think in Kahoot, a lot of times you can't. Um, and then if you want to show the answers, you can just hit this button. I'll post the link to this quiz so you have access to it. You hit that and the correct answers will show up down there too. So it's kind of like pre-made flashcards, I guess, is a, a good way to think about it. This is 20 questions, so a little bit less than like half the length of the exam, um, but hopefully it'll be a helpful study guide for you. Um, okay, I'm going to get this started for Zoom. I'm going to try to, I can't run it on two computers at the same time, but hopefully you can see this. Okay. And if you have questions about any of these, any of these questions, as we go through them or the topics, we can stop and talk about it for a second. I can explain the answer if a lot of people, usually if a lot of people get the wrong answer, I will um, kind of stop and explain the reasoning behind the correct answer. So yeah, joinmyquiz.com and then type in the game code. Can you see that okay, Jimena? Okay, awesome. So these are like, I either gave them 20 seconds or 30 seconds, depending on how involved the questions are. Obviously no pressure, this is really just for your benefit. And if there's a certain, Kind of topic area that you're like i have no idea what this is i don't remember it take note of it definitely go back and study that i think that's what these kinds of quizzes are really particularly helpful for as well
Are we ready? Okay. I think the join information will be at the bottom if we still need it. Here we go. Question number one. This is like an SAT analogy question. Yeah. <laughs> we got fun sounds. Okay. I thought that be anatomy is the study. It is a study of form, but physiology is not structure. Physiology is function. So the first part of that could work. The second part would not. Physiology is the function. Okay. So yeah, structure and function. Anatomy is structure or form. Physiology is function. Okay. What is this reaction, the general category? Nice, you guys use clock. Okay. Skip forward. Decomposition, nice. Okay. So, decomposition and synthesis were the two main categories that I focused on. We talked about exchange a little bit. Decomposition, HCl, that molecule is decomposing into its component parts, H plus and Cl minus. So, it's a decomposition, splitting apart. We didn't talk about hydrolysis, so you can erase that word from your memory for now if you want to. What is a chain of more than 50 amino acids called? Protein, nice, yeah. A polysaccharide is a solid guess. And the poly probably made you think, oh yeah, many. Amino acids make proteins. Does anyone remember what a polysaccharide is? A carbohydrate, yeah. So not it's not a protein, it's a carbohydrate. It is made of many individual monomers, since the poly, but it is a different type of macromolecule. Which of the following is an example of a suspension? All right. Blood cells in plasma. So this is the example I gave you in class. I think it's the one of the only examples I gave you in class, it's the one we focused on. So suspension is where you get separation over time, right? The, the particles within the mixture are really big. They're the, the biggest category of particles within the mixture and they separate out over time. That is a suspension. Muscle muscles that require frequent contractions, need a lot of energy, have a lot of what organelle? Um, ask a question. I ask this question a lot in different classes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Mitochondria, nice. Yeah, so mitochondria make ATP. If a tissue or an organ needs a lot of ATP, its cells are going to have a lot of mitochondria. 
I did post the, I think I mentioned I was going to post the organelle bingo. Um, so you can use that slideshow to study the organelles as well. Try to close yourself on them. Next. Body temperature regulation is an example of a what? Negative feedback. So most people put one of the two options, one of the two things I went over. Neutral feedback. We didn't, I don't even know what that is. I just made it up. So it's not a neutral feedback mechanism. Um, it would either be negative or positive. Negative feedback mechanisms, body temperature is the one that I really talked about a lot as a negative feedback mechanism. So this is negative because say as an individual body temperature goes up, the body, the homeostatic mechanism tries to bring that temperature back down to try to keep it at a certain level. A positive feedback mechanism, does anyone remember the example I gave for that? Labor, yeah, so labor contractions, when the uterus starts to contract, it sends messages to the rest of the body that then get sent back to the uterus to contract even further. So more and more and more of the same thing. Body temperature, we don't want that to happen. We don't want our temperature to just keep going up once it starts to rise, right? So negative feedback mechanism involves um, the response going in the opposite direction of the stimulus the technical way to say it, so opposite directions. Okay, and a homeostatic mechanism, what senses changes in the body? This was almost too easy. Nice. Yay. Everyone got it. The sensor. It's not a trick question. So the receptor or the sensor, you want to know both of those terms. That's what picks up uh, some kind of change in regarding homeostasis. That information gets sent to the integrating or control center. You want to know both of those terms. That's typically the brain. The brain makes a decision as to what to do in response to that stimulus. And then the effector is whatever body part, organ, body system carries out the response. All right, next. Multiple tissues working together form a what? This deals with that main theme of the hierarchy of complexity. Nice, organ. Tissues working together form an organ. Um, what makes a tissue? A bunch of what working together? Cells, yeah. So a bunch of cells working together makes a tissue. Tissues working together make an organ. What's above that? Organ system, yeah. So make sure you know that hierarchy and know the smaller pieces and then what those build into. The following organ system plays a large role in processing sensory information. Processing is a pretty key word here. On the leaderboard. All right. We got some upward movement. Nervous, nice. Integumentary is a solid guess. So that is uh, kind of the only other one that I would think would potentially be an answer. The integumentary system takes in sensory information, but it doesn't process it. 
the brain, the nervous system is what does the processing of that information. So we need to know all 11 of those mm -hmm. and all their functions. Yeah, so we went over that little chart we filled out. I told you the functions you need to know for each one. Um, so you don't need to know each and everything, but that's one of the functions for the nervous system that I mentioned. Yeah, so you do need to know the organ system beyond just like, what are we doing in here? Bone, muscle, nervous. Those are the main ones we're going to go into a lot of detail on, but you also need to know what the endocrine system does, the lymphatic, respiratory, in a very general sense. Yes, good question. Uh, we'll do a tegumentary in here too. Yeah. The lungs are found in what cavity? <clears throat> Plural, pretty nice. Yep. Yeah. So abdominal will be a good second guess potentially, but plural refers to lungs. So that term, anytime you see plural something, um, it's going to refer to something with the lungs. So the plural cavity is the cavity that houses the lungs. That's really the only organ that you need to know in the plural cavity. It's pretty much it. Um, the abdominal cavity is below the lungs, so below the diaphragm. <laughs> this is the net movement of solute particles down or with their concentration gradient. Diffusion. Okay, so a lot of people, this is kind of a, a tougher question. So diffusion is the net movement, well, it's written up there, it's the net movement of molecules down their concentration gradient. So they're moving from where there's a lot of themselves to where there's fewer. That's what molecules do naturally. Does that require ATP? No, it is passive. You don't need any energy for that. That's just what molecules do all on their own. Um, osmosis is specifically water, so that's why I underline solute. Um, osmosis is the diffusion of water, which is not, we wouldn't consider that a solute. That's a little trickier. Uh, these two active transport, so sodium potassium pump is an example of an active transport, so it's kind of a sub subcategory under active transport. Active transport is the opposite of this, so solute particles would move up or against their concentration gradient. And that requires ATP, right? You need energy for that. It doesn't happen naturally. You're trying to increase the concentration where there's already a lot of particles. So that is active. Oh, someone this morning, I hadn't really thought of this before. Diffusion, D down, down the concentration gradient. Active against the concentration gradient, A. I had never thought of that before. So if that helps you remember, which direction the particles are moving, that could be helpful. A cell in a hypertonic solution will do what? Nice. Okay, so most people got that. A cell in a hypertonic solution will shrink. Why does a cell in a hypertonic solution shrink? Where's the water going? Yeah, the water goes outside the cell because there's more solute outside the cell. 
if you imagine, so this, you can imagine if I say a hypertonic solution, just like a beaker um, with a lot of salt water in it, salty water, you drop a cell in there. So that cell is in the hypertonic solution and the water in that cell is gonna leave the cell. It's gonna go towards the higher solute concentration, which means the cell will shrink down. If I said a hypotonic solution, expand would be the answer. Water would go into the cell because there's more solute inside the cell. This type of bond results in partial positive and partial negative, partial regions in a molecule. Polar covalent. Ionic is a solid second guess. It is not right, but it's a good guess because you know in ionic bonds you end up having a positive and negative, right? But it's not partial. So here are the partial positive and partial negative in a molecule. That's going to indicate it's polar covalent. Um, so I'd probably on the test I'd say there's a sharing of electrons, which would probably help you get to polar to covalent over ionic because ionic is a total transfer of electrons, right? From one atom to another. Um, polar covalent, the polar aspect is that what creates that partial positive and partial negative. It's an unequal sharing of electrons, which means you have kind of a positive side of the molecule and kind of a negative side. Questions about that? Okay. Which term describes the formation of a larger molecule from two smaller ones? Ooh, that was a tough one. Anabolism. Ionization is where um, an ionically bonded molecule will separate into its respective ions. So it's actually the opposite of building something. Um, anabolism and catabolism are the two parts of metabolism. So if you have an organism's metabolism, they're building bonds and making bigger molecules, and then they're breaking those molecules down Anabolism is the building of larger molecules from their component parts. So if you take monomers and stick them together, you're the, that's an, an example of anabolism. Catabolism is the opposite. You're breaking down a bigger molecule. Any questions about that? Okay. Which of the following is not hydrophobic? Not hydrophobic. Nice, sucrose. So most people just barely got that. Uh, what are these three other things? What category do they fall into? What's that? Cholesterol, fatty acids, and phospholipids are all one category of macromolecule, one of the four big ones. Lipids, yeah. Sorry, I don't know if you guys are saying that very well. <laughs> so they're all lipids. All lipids are hydrophobic. So if you knew these were all lipids, you would think they're all hydrophobic. What is sucrose? 
A carbohydrate, yeah. So carbohydrates are not hydrophobic. Even if you didn't know carbohydrates weren't hydrophobic, you know, hopefully these three are. We could do a process of elimination. Uh, right, anatomical terminology. What's the neck region called? <laughs> Nice job. <laughs> Everyone got that cervical region. So cervical is the neck region. Make sure you review all of those terms. At least you heard them in lab too. Kind of nice around twice. Or helpful, maybe not nice. All right. The umbilical region is what to the spine. So this is a directional term. It's kind of a tougher one. All right, so first off, what's the umbilical region? Where is that? Your belly button. Yes. Okay, so belly button's fine. We know the belly button's in front of the spine, so you have to figure out what the heck term is going to apply to that. That is ventral. So I used the less common one. So ventral and anterior are synonyms, right? And then posterior and what? Dorsal. Yeah, so you want to know both of those combinations because they are used interchangeably. Um, if we were on all fours, we would typically, that's where ventral comes from. That's the underside of the body. So... The umbilical region is ventral in front of the spine, which is on the back of the body. Take your time when you're answering these questions to make sure you're not flipping it. Like the spine is dorsal or posterior to the umbilical. Make sure you know which I am, which direction you need to go in. You should have plenty of time to finish the exam, so don't rush through it on Monday. What organ system includes thyroid glands and pancreas? So this is also an organ system that we cover in AMP2, <clears throat> not in AMP1. Yes, <laughs> the lymphatic and endocrine are so easy to confuse. Um, the endocrine system deals with hormones. That's where uh, it deals with the releasing and production of hormones. The thyroid glands, if you know anything about them, are really important in releasing hormones um, in the body. The pancreas also uh, has a large, a large part in the endocrine system. Um, it also, I see one digestive, the pancreas is involved in the digestive system as well. So it, you know, kind of plays double duty, but the thyroid glands only in endocrine system. The lymphatic system deals with returning of uh, fluids to the blood. So it kind of filters the blood and then returns that fluid, getting rid of anything dangerous back to the blood. Questions about that? Okay, two more, number 19 out of 20. An oxygen atom has eight total electrons. How many more does it need to fill its valence shell? Draw this out, this throws people off. <laughs> All right, sweet, most people got that, that's awesome. So how many, if it has eight electrons total, how many go in the first shell? Two, I think I heard two. And then how many does that leave for the second shell? Six, right? So one, two, 
two, three, four, five, six. So how many electrons does that valence shell hold, hold total? Eight, right? So it leaves, we need one, two more. So that leaves two. When I ask you a question about valence, um, and how many more electrons it needs or how many it has, read the question really carefully because it's easy to assume I'm asking one thing. Um, but if I had just said, you know, how many valence electrons does it have total? The answer would be six, not how many more does it need, right? How many more does it need to fit? fill the shell is two. So be really careful when you're reading those questions. It's easy to get thrown off. Last one. Oh, this one's hopefully easy. Water is a lot of things, but which of these options? <laughs> it is polar. Well, I. Pretty much everyone got that. Okay, it's polar. I was going to draw a, a water molecule, but it's slightly positively charged near the hydrogen, slightly negatively charged near the oxygen. That makes it polar. It has a positive and negative pole. Um, okay, so hopefully that helps you guys. Let's see. Who came in first? Last time it covered it up. Okay, there we go. Friend, nice. Gracie, Josie, awesome. Good job, guys. I don't have any treats. I'm sorry. I <laughs> totally forgot. Um, I had more Starbucks, Starburst in my office. I could have brought them. Okay, so hopefully that helps you realize areas that you really need to study. Um, I will post, like I said, post this link. You can go back to it, study it, quiz yourself. Um, any other thing, any other items you guys want to go over, topics, things you're confused about? Okay, don't leave the study until Sunday night, please <laughs> study a little bit throughout the weekend um, and email me if you have any questions about any of this material. Otherwise, I'll see y'all on Monday in here at 11.